Stop worrying, worrying how the story ends. I let go and I let God, let God have his way. That's when things start happening. I stopped looking at back then I let go and I let God Let God have his way Soon as I stopped worrying Worrying how the story ends I let go and I let God let God have his way soon as I stopped worrying worrying how the story ends I His way. Let God have 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 His way. Holy Spirit, stand in my body and Think your thoughts, speak your words, hold hostage my attention and pin my ear to the fence post of your wisdom, whisper unto me those sacred truths that unlock the deep mysteries tucked away in this text. Lord, you be the preacher, I'll be the voice. Apprehend, arrange, and arrest all of my scattered thoughts. Lord, I'm not worthy to stand behind this, your sacred desk, but I beg of you, please don't punish your people for the sins of your servant. Lord, I'm asking that everything that's good that takes place in this sermonic hour, I pray, you remind, remind me not to take any credit for what you've done but to give your name the praise now Lord transform me until you are satisfied with the way you made me transform me until you are satisfied with what you see change me until when you look at me you see yourself in Jesus name now Lord take this word fertilize our church and transform our church until it is what you want it to be into what you've called it to be it's your house and we surrender to your will and your way in Jesus name amen come on give the Lord praise today come on we can do better than that give the Lord praise hallelujah hallelujah what a joy it is to be back in the house of the Lord again to all of our preachers and to our deacons and to all of you who make up this bread house family. Isn't it good to be back in the house one more time today? Amen. Amen. I said, isn't it good to be back in the house again? What a joy it is. What a joy it is. Let me tip my hat to this amazing choir. Come on, give you this choir a hand, y'all. Amen. I missed y'all. I, I missed y'all. Thank you so much.
good to see you all serving in the kingdom and in the house. God bless you. God keep you. Thank you so much to our music ministry, to uh, Brother Blue and Brother Colin, and to all of you who make our music ministry what it is. It's good to see music and worship and praise happening again. Give yourselves a hand. Come on, choir. Give yourselves a hand for what God has done and is doing. Um, let me um, let me say that I'm so glad to have been that we've been in this series. We're in part three of this series entitled Transformation, uh, Transformation, and I've been in a Bible study series this uh, month entitled The Power of You. Uh, you should find, do yourself a favor and get the word that God has sent for you in this season. Uh, we greet you with Jesus' joy, and we thank God for an opportunity to serve and to deliver the word, but I also thank God for an opportunity to hear the word, so make sure uh, you get the information God is trying to get to you. Uh, meet me in Psalms chapter 55, verse 19, and we're going to do part three of this series entitled Transformation. We'll be doing part three of this series entitled Transformation, and so I want to make sure that... Um, you get the word. Now, we will be entertaining questions today and throughout this series, but particularly on this message, I want to entertain questions as well. So we'll be allowing you to ask questions. You can text your question in anonymously. Nobody will know who asked, but we will get your question. Now, trust me, uh, we will get your question and we will read your question um, privately before we read it publicly because Ain't no telling what some folk might say. We want to make sure. Uh, but I also want to make sure that we have an opportunity to answer any questions. I'm going to try to answer them live right here on the spot. So if you are listening to the message and you have a question that you are dying to ask or that you just don't, you, you want to ask, there's no such thing as a bad question. Ask it, and I'm going to answer it right here while I'm preaching on the spot. If I don't know the answer, I won't make one up. I'll just tell you I don't know, and I'll get back to you on that. But, um, but I want to make sure that we are true to the text and true to what God has to say to us concerning this matter. Psalms 59, 55, verse 19, just one verse. I'm going to be all over the Bible today, so keep your Bibles open. I'm still going to be all over the Bible, so you'll want to keep your Bibles open for that. But I'm going to read one verse uh, that will kind of give us our thematic thrust for this particular message. And it reads like this, God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old, Selah, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. The text says, because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. I'm going to give you my subject in a minute. Just You may take your seats. I'm going to give you my subject in a minute. It does not touch you, but it most certainly can terrify you. It's been labeled by many to be the most frightening feeling known to man. It paralyzes one's progress. It forfeits one's future. It drives you to abort your assignment and sabotage your own success. It bullies you to abandon your destiny due to an evil level of comfort with familiarity. I said it bullies you to abandon your destiny because of an evil level of comfort with familiarity. Psychologists call it metathesiophobia. Simply put, it is the fear of change. And that's exactly what I want to talk about today, the fear of change. Transformation simply cannot occur without change because anything that intends to transform must submit to being reformed. Truth be told, 
many of us are terrified of change. We are frightened by change. We, we are worried about change. And the sad reality is, is that many of us believers want change, yet we won't change due to our fear of change. I think I'm going to say that again. I said many of us, we want change, yet we won't change due to our Fear of change. It, it is something wrong with a believer who wants everything and everybody around them to change, yet they themselves refuse to change. It's something wrong with a church member that wants the leaders to change, the church to change, and everybody and every ministry to change, but they refuse to to change. It's something wrong with us when we, it is something hypocritical about us when we refuse to be the change we want to see. That's not just in the, in, in the church life, but that's also in your personal life. There are some people that are married, they want their spouse to change, but they refuse to change themselves. You want your spouse to be faithful while you still try to figure out where your loyalty is. You want your spouse to be a provider and you still trying to figure out if you going to keep a job or not. You want your children to be well behaved, but you still ain't figured out if you going to stop clubbing and you going to stop showing out and you going to stop living any kind of way. It amazes me how folks want change, yet they won't change. They, it, it, isn't, it even, isn't it even more sad that folks can see how others need to change, but they cannot figure out how they must change? Can I suggest to you that it is sickening and disturbing how many people in the kingdom can see the need for change in everybody else? but cannot see the need for change in themselves. They can tell you that you need to fix your attitude. They can tell you that you need to work on your marriage. They can tell you that you need to be more, more devoted. They can tell, but they can't tell you about how the things they need to change. Wish I had somebody talk back to me up in here. There's so many of us, we can see the need for everybody's change, but ours but ours. The fear of change will force you to accept poverty in exchange for prosperity. The fear of change will threaten your maturity because you feel safe in stupidity. Oh, can I say that one more time for the people in the back? I said, some of us, we, 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 the, we have this fear of change that will threaten our maturity because we find safety and comfort in stupidity. You've been this way all your life. And so you ain't, so you say things like, this just who I am. Accept me who I am. And let me pull over right there and remind you that that statement has no biblical address. It has never been written where God told you to just be yourself and folks to accept you the way you are. Truth be told, if you got any real friends in your life, they will never accept you for the way you are. They will always demand you to change for the better. But so many of us have found safety in our stupidity, safety in our in, in, immaturity because we've been this way all our life. So we make folk accept us the way we are. The fear of change will have you settling for less when you know you are worth more. It'll have you settling for less when you know you are worth more. Talking to somebody right now, you know that situation ain't working out and you deserve better but you putting up with it because you don't think you gonna do better. But I need to give somebody a prophetic announcement that if you ever get a glimpse of what could be, 
you ought never be satisfied with what has been. I've decided I'm going to take my chances with greater. I'm not going to take no more chances with lesser because guess what? What's the worst that could happen? If I don't get greater, I can't do nothing but go back to what I've been had. So you might as well take your chances on better. But we accept anything because we refuse to change. We will accept, we will take less because we're terrified of more. But I found out that we don't like to change for the better because better circumstances require better versions of you. Ah. You will take the little old job you got now because you know if they promote you, it's going to require more of you. If they pay you more money, you're going to have to do more stuff. If you decide, you, you don't mind being a little boyfriend right now, but you won't be a husband because if I got to be a husband, it's going to require more of you. Ladies, let me holler at you real quick. Stop settling for stupidity from somebody that can't grow up. It is not your fault that they won't grow up. It's not your fault that they won't change. Stop blaming yourself. It's not you. It's them. And it's time to make a change. Oh, it ain't. Sometimes, y'all, when you change, change can be hurtful. Change can hurt, but it's necessary. Sometimes you've got to forgive yourself if you want change to happen. So many of us are trapped in our own guilt and we cannot change because we don't think we deserve better. But that devil is a lie. Jesus said that I came that you may have life and that more abundantly. You better change for the better. In order for change to happen, Something must die or be left behind. I said in order for change to happen, something must die or be left behind. Perhaps the reason death is so frightening is because it brings about a change. It changes the one who died and it changes those who are left to live. Death brings about change. And I need you to understand that one of the reasons we fear change so much is because in order for change to happen, something must die. In order for me to be a better version of me, the old me has to die. In order for me to change my financial status, my old financial habits have to die and my new habits. Ha In order for me to change my circle, I've got to abandon this circle because change requires death. I need you to understand that that's the reason why we stay where we are. And too many of us are saved, sanctified and stuck because you are here, but you won't do better. Why? Because you don't want what you've got to die because you've been living with it all this time. It's the only thing you know. But I need you to understand, just like God said in the Bible, God is doing a new thing. <laughs> and when he's doing a new thing, it requires a new you. Change is necessary. It's necessary. In today's sermonic dialogue, I intend to explore a few principles that will help us overcome the fear of change. Although all throughout scripture, there are characters who have had to deal with change in one degree or another. Reasons, the, the, all throughout the Bible, there have been characters who've had to deal with a change of life, a change of circumstances, a change in, 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 in personality. Everything around us has to change. They tell me if you don't like the weather in Texas, just wait a minute because it's probably going to change. It, it, the city I live in, the city we live in, the state we live in, we could have snow in the morning and sun in the afternoon and a blizzard that night. That's because things change. Seasons 
change. Everything around, as a matter of fact, as seasons change, things that live within the seasons change. I need to remind you, Bethlehem, that everything must change, including our church. If our church was the same way it was in 1920-something, whenever it was born, then we'd be in trouble. If we remain the same, we will never grow. Change is necessary for growth. There is no way your church can move and, be, and, 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 and grow and develop and stay relevant if it refuses to change. But if your church must change, then you must change. The members must change. Is there a question? What's the question? Why does something have to change? No, why does something have to die to change? Yeah, okay, so why does, the question is, why does something have to die in order for, say that one more time. Why does something have to die to change? Okay, I don't know that I've said that something has to die for it to change. I'm saying that something has to die for you to, so for example, um, if, if, if I'm deciding to, um, be a, to, to, do, to do better with my business, my company, then if I want to make a better business and make better business decisions and to build a, be a bigger business, then the way I used to do business has to die. The way I do business now, because watch this, for every new level, it requires a new set of skills, a new level of commitment. So some things have to die. So uh, and here's another example. If I want to be a better Christian, then the way I used to live as a Christian has to die. I'm in Bible country. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature and old things. Are, it don't mean there was something wrong with what you were doing. It just means that it don't fit where you're going. Preach, Pastor Jay. I said it don't mean that there's something wrong with what you're doing it just means that it's no longer enough for where you're going some things have to die in order for other things to change if you intend to save your marriage it might mean that you got to stop doing certain things the old version of you has to die old habits have to die so that your new so that your better marriage can you can't operate the same way you've operated the last five years because you're trying to get a better marriage that means some things some habits have to die. Now to give you a little more deeper answer to that question, it is up to you, depending upon what it is will determine what needs to die. Because not everything needs to die in order for everything to change. But you need to have the wisdom to know what needs to live and what needs to die. Okay? So although all throughout scripture there is, there is a plethora of situations where things change. Things change for the worse. They change for the better, but there's all throughout scripture people and groups of people and persons who have had to endure transformation and change. And I want you to understand that with every season, it requires a change. And so there is no way, if you're praying, Lord, make our church better. Lord, make our church greater. If you're praying for that, then you're also praying for change. If you're praying, Lord, send us people, then it's going to require you to change because everybody God sent ain't grew up here like you have. They ain't got kinfolk here like you do. They ain't got loyalty to the church like you do. So you're going to have to change the way you operate, preach Pastor Jay. I'm helping somebody because too many Many of us have turned the church into a country club for members. Oh, but this ain't no country club. And I need to, I'll tell, I'll tell all of y'all in a minute, I don't have any dogs in the fight. All of my relatives come from across the water, so I don't have no dogs in the fight here. The only thing I'm pulling for is Bethlehem. And at the end of the day, I don't care how long you've been here, who your mama name is, who your charter name member is. At the end of the day, God said, this is my house. And if you want to make it your house, then take God's name off of it. Ooh, Lord, help me preach your word. Lord, help me preach your word. And so, 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 so I said, Lord, why do we hate change so much? Why is it so hard for us to change? And one of the things I found out was that this sit, we deal with situational paralysis from past traumas. Ha! <laughs> oh. I said we deal with situational paralysis. You know what paralysis means, right? It means to be paralyzed. 
from past trauma. So here's what I mean. When we have, when we, a lot of times when we experience trauma in our lives, trauma, we get stuck where we are. Whatever that trauma may have been, we'll get stuck there. And so we won't move, we won't change, we won't develop, we'll get stuck there because we found safety in where we got stuck. See, watch this. When we experience trauma, we run to a safe spot, the closest, nearest safe space. And then we stay there. And because that place gave us refuge and a hiding place from where we found our trauma, then the problem is when it's time to come out, we don't want to because we are we, we can't change our location because we're still stuck in our devastation. So that trauma has us paralyzed. The, the, baby, let me tell you something. The reason you are the way you are is because of what you've been through. It ain't because everybody. So what you do is you see everybody through the lens of what hurts you. Oh, am I too? Am I talking to up in here? You see everybody that tries to help you as somebody that's trying to hurt you. And you praying, Lord, send help. Lord, send help. And when he sends it, you always sending it away because you're worried that it's going to be what it used to be. So now you are stuck and won't change. You stuck because at least I know this place. At least I'm familiar with this pain. At least, ooh, who am I talking to up in? Lord, help me preach your word. At least I know these demons. I know this trauma. And ain't no way I'm going to leave these because I know where all of them are. So you'll be comfortable sleeping with devils rather than to go find change with angels. Why? Because you've been paralyzed by your trauma. Another fear of change is failure. We don't change because we're terrified that we're going to fail. And watch this. That fear of failure is based upon past failures. I ain't trying this because the last time I tried it, I failed. I ain't trying it because the last time I tried it, I failed. Last time I did it, I messed it up. And I need to remind somebody, somebody, the Lord told me to tell you and try again. Try again. You remember when Peter and them was fishing, they were fishing and, and they toiled all night. Mama, they toiled all night and caught nothing. And, and Jesus shows up. Now, mind you, Peter ain't no rookie fisherman. Peter is a professional fisherman. He's, uh, he's, he's one of the best at the trade. And he's been toiling all night. And Jesus shows up and says, try again on this side. Peter says, now I know you know kingdom and I know you know heaven and I know you know God, but, but I know fishing. Mm -hmm. I know fishing. He says, he says, but nevertheless at your word, I think I need to stop right there and have somebody understand that although that's your field, it don't mean it ain't God's will. And I need to help somebody up in here that baby, God don't need your expertise. Who you think put the fish in the water? Who you think put the water there for the fish? Oh, I wish I had somebody up in here that can be reminded. I need to help somebody with a prophetic announcement. Baby, try again. Why? Because his word said so. And if he say try again, baby, try it again. Don't be worried about failure. Do you know how many things, how many successes have been built on the backs of failures? But, but, but then there was a fear of, there was a fear of failure, there was a fear of, there was a fear of, of past trauma. There, but another reason we fear change is because of success. Can I say something to you? Sometimes we're afraid it might work. <laughs> oh. well, Pastor, why would I be afraid of change? Because it might work. Because you know that if it works, you're going to be responsible for it. Do you know how many times we pray for stuff and never, never ask ourselves, what happens if we actually get it? <laughs> Lord, send me a husband. Lord, send me a husband. Send me a good man. And then you don't think about the fact that that's going to also require you to be a good woman. Because <laughs> you can't be who you are now. 
and call yourself being with a good man. <laughs> Does that make sense what I'm saying? Lord, send us a pastor. Okay. That's fine. I'll send you one, but that's going to require you to be a better member. Ooh. Lord, send me a new job. But that's going to require you to, because you can't treat this job like you treat that job. It's going to require you to get up and be on time. It's going to require you to actually be productive at work instead of riding these people clock. Oh, look at how y'all looking at me up in here. Oh, come on, look at how y'all looking at me up in here. See, we want, we, we're afraid that it might work. Because if it works, we got to do better. We got to do better. See, 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 Bethlehem, if we're praying that God send us people, then we might better be concerned about him sending us people. Why? Because if it works, then that's going to require you to get somewhere and sit down. Oh, Lord, send us people to help. But then when they help you, you mad because they, they better at what you ain't been doing for 20 years. Oh, y'all mad today? I, don't, I ain't scared of nobody in the... Can I run that back, Pop? So, so here's what happens. Lord, send us some members. Lord, send us some people. And then when they get here, they want to do... They do in 10 days more than what you've done in 20 years, and you got the audacity to be mad. Well, I'm going to tell you... I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to work with whoever work. And I don't care how long you've been here. If you ain't been working, you won't be working. Lord, help me preach your word. So, but, but, but another fear, another fear, uh, uh, another thing, the reason we fear change is because of lack of control. Ooh, because see, because see, I control things right now. Where I am right now, I can control it. I can manipulate it. But if I don't, but if I change, I don't know what I can control. Can I tell you that some of us are control freaks? We like to run everything. We, matter of fact, can I give you, a, can I give you a, a way you can know you're a control freak? If you don't move until God gives you all the information, you're a control freak. Because you won't move, do what God says until he tells you everything. Lord, when you going to do it? Lord, how you going to do it? Who you going to send to do it? How much it's going to cost me? How I got to go over there? Lord ain't got to give you everything. When God says move, just move. When God says change, just change. So, Lord, how am I going to overcome fear? Can I tell you one way you need to do it? Fear God. Fear God. Look, look, don't worry about it. I brought Bible with me. Look at Psalms 55, verse 16 through 19. Fear God. Now watch this. No fear of God is driven by a fear of change. When people don't fear God, it's because they also have a fear of change. Whew. See, when you don't fear God, the reason why you can't get rid of them habits because you don't fear God is because you're afraid that you're going to have to change. You're going to have to. If you, if you know that if you really want to get close to God and you want to have a better relationship with God, it's going to require you to get rid of some of that stuff that you've been doing. Change. People that don't fear God also have a fear of change. What would happen if we feared God the way we feared people? Because if you read the entire chapter of Psalm 55, you will discover that he's talking and praying to God about people that are his enemies, always bothering him. They are coming against him. These are his haters. And look at, I want to look, before we go to 16, look at verse 6. I'm going to show you how, I'm going to show you something about verse 6 that, 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 that we find. Look at verse 6. He says, and I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove. For then I would fly away and be at rest. This teaches us that some people would rather leave than change. Ooh, can I say that again? Because y'all, come on, y'all wake up. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. I said some of us would rather leave a thing than change in the thing. Since we, since if I got to change, I just go find me another church where I ain't got to change yet. 
Ooh, ah. I just go, where I can, a place where I can just go sit back and don't nobody know who I am and do, I can do whatever I want to because I ain't got to change. I can just be who I am. And there's something wrong with the church that does not require you to change. So watch this. A lot of us would rather check out than change. I'm, I'm out. I'm leaving. It's so much easier to leave than it is for you to change. That, that's what we do. It is so much easier for us to leave you know why? Because we cowards. Mm-hmm. Cowards. Too weak to change. Too weak to change. Look, look at verse 16. I'm show you something. Verse 16 says, I called to God. He's talking about the people that's been bothering him. He says, I called to God and the Lord will save me. He says, I called to God. And the Lord will save me. Verse 17. Evening, morning, noon, I utter my complaint, meaning I pray. And he hears my voice. So watch this. He prays to God. Morning, noon, and night, he's praying. He's praying to God about those that are coming against him. He's praying to God about those that are, that are a problem in his life. He Watch this. Pastor, what does this have to do with the fear of God? If, I'll tell you what. If you have people in your life that are your enemies and you have not prayed, you have a problem. Why? Because if I fear God, then it will change the way I handle haters. Ah. <sighs> See, here's where the change is required. If you're going to change, it's going to require you to change the way you deal with folks you don't like. Oh, y'all don't like that. Y'all don't like that. Because, cause, cause see, cause see we, we want, remember I told you earlier, we want everybody to change but us. But see, you're going to have to change the way you deal with folks that mistreat you. Mm-hmm. I said, you're going to have to change the way you deal with people that mistreat you. <laughs> Because everybody ain't going to treat you nicely, but you're going to have to respond godly. I said, everybody ain't going to treat you nicely, but you still have to respond godly. And see, that's the change we don't want to make. We'll pray, Lord, send the healing, but we won't pray, Lord, help me to forgive. Oh, God, I wish I had somebody talk back to me up in here. We'll pray, Lord, I need a miracle. And he's saying, yeah, I know, but I also need you to be more merciful. You know, you know what's something wrong with us church folks? We don't like to extend mercy, but we always need to receive it. Do you know what mercy is? Mercy is that thing that stops us from getting what we actually deserved. Truth be told, you did some things. You said some things. You've been some places. But mercy showed up and you should have got this, but you didn't get that. And oh, I wish I had somebody that would just think back for a little bit over the stuff God should have punished you for. He could have punished you for. Which is why when you know God has to give you mercy, it's a little easier for you to say, you know what, I'm going to go on and step back and let you make it. It'll change the way you deal with haters. He prays morning, noon, and night. And he prays in, in, in verse 18. He says, he redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage for many are against me. He ain't dealing with a few people. He dealing with a whole lot of folks that can't stand him. Do you know, I, I, I did some homework. And did what I found out is that the majority of the people that hated this author didn't even know him. Can I pull over right there and remind you that all of your haters ain't people that know your name. All of your people that don't like you, some of them don't even know you. Isn't it funny how folk that don't know you can't stand you? They, they dislike you because of what they heard. <laughs> But God loves you and he knows. Oh, it amazes me how folks come for me. But I don't know them. I ain't never met them. But they come for me. And I, you know what I realized? I found out something interesting. It had nothing. To, the attack that they launched had nothing to do with me. It had to do with what's in me. Oh. 
See, I found out, I ain't Holly, that some folks never bothered me until I became a pastor. <laughs> Because before I was a pastor, I was irrelevant. But when the moment I started pastoring, now somebody got something to say. I need to help you understand that there is no such thing as elevation without people hating on you. You will always have promotion that's coming with people. There, let me put it this way. For every elevator, there's a hater. Every last one of them. And so, so I learned this the hard way, y'all. I learned this the hard way, that sometimes they're coming for what's in you. But he prayed. He prayed. And look at verse 19. He says, God will give ear and humble them. He will hear me and humble them. He who is enthroned from of old. What trips me out? He says, he who is enthroned from of old, in verse 19. Enthroned from of old. Even he that abideth of old. I said, Lord, what does that mean? He says, it means those folks that are set in their ways. <laughs> I'm, can, I'm let, some of your haters don't like change in you because they set and ain't going to change in themselves. So they're terrified of the change you already made. Because, but that change you've made threatens the change they're going to have to make. Be careful. with. See, this is why you, if you're trying to be a better you, you can't be stuck with people who sit in their ways. Look at what the text says. He says enthroned. He says those enthroned from of old. That word enthroned means that they have been, they have been, they have been, they found kingship and uh, 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 they sit on the throne of the past. They sit on the throne. So what they do is they remind you of their past success, which is no longer presently relevant. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, can I teach right there for a little bit? I used to be over this and I used to be over that and I used to do this and I, but baby you don't do that anymore watch this and even if you still do it ain't nobody coming to it ain't nobody meeting with it ain't nobody doing nothing with it you I mean watch this if you a leader with no followers you just somebody taking a walk enthroned of old set in their ways ain't gonna ever change we've been doing it this way for 40 years and tell me how far has that gotten you well it worked back then but we not back then it worked does it work today church has to change and it's gonna require us to dethrone some of these old Kings that think they got it figured out. And don't get me wrong, back then it worked for that time. But we in a different time. And not everything has to change, but some things have to change. See, right now I'm the pastor. But 50 years from now, I may not be relevant. And what I've learned is that you have to be relevant when you are relevant. And when you're not, you need to learn to sit back so God can elevate the next generation. Oh, y'all don't like that kind of teaching. You don't like that kind of teaching. Because see, see, as a parent, just because that's the way y'all was raised and that's the way you did things don't mean that's the way your kid got to do it. Oh, you don't like this kind of teaching. Because see, because see, watch this. Your kids are dealing with things you ain't never dealt with before. See, back then, you know, when I was growing up, we, we, we went outside to play. We played throw up tackle. You throw up the ball, whoever catch it, take off running, and everybody go tackle them. That was the game. Wasn't no refs, no lines, just a yard and a ball. <laughs> when we went outside, we played outside. And guess what? We didn't come back in till it was time to come back in. Wasn't no running in and out of mama's house. You know, when we played, we played outside, but I can't let my kids play outside now. Why? Because it's a different time now. It's a different devil we dealing with now. We didn't have cyber sex because we didn't have cyber. 
We didn't have cell phones when I grew up. We had a house phone in the living room. And you had to go all the way to the house phone and you pick it up and you please don't mess up because you have to start all over. Oh, two, one. We had one phone. But now our kids got cell phones in their bedroom and you don't know what they looking at, who they talking to, and you trying to apply old rules to a new season. So you telling them what your grandmama did for you, but baby, you got to learn they not where you are. They dealing with new demons now. They not dealing with the same things we dealt with. They not dealing with the same struggles we dealt with. So we have to change the way we do things. It's from old, but look at what he says. Because they do not change, they do not fear God. Be careful with folks who don't want to grow up. Because what it really shows you is they don't fear God. They don't, want to, they don't want any better habits. They don't want to change the way they talk and the way they walk and the way they operate because, you know, they don't fear God. Anybody that won't grow up, don't fear God. Because there's no way you can fear God and not change. Well, Pastor God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Yeah, but you not. He is, you not. You are always changing. As a matter of fact, well, well, see, watch this. It's not God that changes. It's what we know about him that changes. See, we get introduced to new versions of God the more we grow. Your old, see, your version of God has never changed. But that shows me that you ain't grown because you have not learned more about God than you learned 20 years ago. And God is bigger than what you know about him. He's bigger than your imagination. He's bigger than what you've been taught. So fear God is one way to overcome change, to overcome the fear of change. Another way is to know your fears. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. I'm going to show you something. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Now, when you explore your fear of change, you will find out why you're afraid to change. Explore why you're afraid to change. But many of us, we experience our fear of change, but we don't ever explore it. But why is it that I don't want to change? What is it that's stopping me from making these changes? If you've got a habit you're trying to get rid of, ask yourself, what is it that I don't want to let go of? Why am I afraid of change? What is it that I'm being loyal to? What bad decisions am I being loyal to? And he says, because watch this, you can't fix a fear that you won't face. Now look at what the Bible says in, in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. He says, God, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. Watch this. Watch this, y'all. He says, God has not given us, which means that, that only leaves one source. If God didn't give you the spirit of fear, then who gave it to you? If you're afraid of change, then that fear can only come from one place, the enemy. Why? What, 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 but, 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 wait, wait a minute. He says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. That tells me that fear is not a feeling. It's a spirit. Hmm. It's not a something. It's a someone. Fear is an evil spirit that paralyzes you. It keeps you. It's not a feeling. It's a spirit. Watch this. Evil spirits need two things, a person and a purpose. Any evil spirit that occupies this land, it needs a person to occupy in and it needs a purpose. Do you know the spirit of fear? That purpose is to prevent your change. Why? Why? Why would the devil want to stop you from changing? Let me tell you why. Because you do know that God is not the only spiritual being that can see into the future. But Satan can too. So watch this. If the enemy can see into my future, 
like God can see into my future, then if the enemy wants to stop my progress, then he better affect my ability to change. Because if he, he knows that if I ever realize my potential, if I ever realize what I'm called to be, if I ever become that, then I will be a threat to every devil in my family. I'd be a threat to every devil at my job. The worst thing that can ever happen to the devil is for you to change. So he makes sure you are terrified of change. Do you not know he wants it so bad that he'll, find, he'll help make your hell comfortable? Oh, y'all don't like this. I said he'll help make your hell comfortable. Well, I know it's, we, we, I know I'm dating somebody married, but, but, but they, they my peace. That he makes your hell comfortable. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing ain't right, but you don't know how, how good it's been helping me out through those bad times. That's because he makes your hell comfortable and you will be loyal to your evil decisions. Why? Because the devil himself knows that if you ever get delivered, you coming for everything behind you. Your children, your grandchildren, your cousins, your co-workers, everything you touch, coming, you coming for it. So he makes you comfortable in your chaos. He'll even make you so comfortable that you'll start defending what you ain't got no business doing. Oh, I said you'll start defending what you ain't got no business doing. How you going to judge me? Now you defending what you ain't got. You know, watch this. You've been doing it all your life. Now you got a problem. That don't mean what they said is wrong just because they also guilty. The last thing is this. So we, we, if you're going to overcome your fear of change, you overcome, you, you deal, you need to have a fear of God. You need to know your fears. And finally, you need to accept what's changed. If you're going to overcome your fear of change, usually we have to change because things have changed. Usually we have to change because things have changed. And you need to accept what's changed. Look at Genesis chapter 8, verse 15. Actually, hold on, before I go, uh -uh, go back, go back, go back to Romans 8 and 14. Forgot to cover this. Romans 8 and 14. Romans 8 and 14. Still, still dealing with knowing your fear. Knowing your fear. Look at what he says in for, verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Okay? Verse 15. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into your fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry our father. So he says in verse 14, all of us who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. If you are led by the Spirit of God, you are automatically inheritance of his. Now, in verse 15, he says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery. What's the spirit of slavery? It, let me be as clear as I can be. All of us, God intended for us to be slaves. Yes, all of us. He intended for us to be slaves to him and nothing else and nobody else. You are never meant to operate on your own. So stop walking around here talking about I'm doing me. I'm going to be myself. You were never meant to be on your own. God always designed you to be a slave to him. That's why he is the master and you are the slave. So that means your life is not your own. You don't get to do with it what you want to. It's not your prerogative. The, everything you have is not yours by ownership. It's yours by stewardship. Everything you've given birth to belongs to God. All that you have is the property of God. I'm in Bible country. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. Hear me when I tell you this. God owns it all. It's yours by stewardship, not by ownership. So when he says you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, he's telling you that I did not bring you here with me 
for you to go back to being afraid. Some of us get saved and we still scary. How you got the most high God in your house and you still walking around here terrified of change? One thing I know about God is that no matter how things change, his presence will always be there. That's why you all not worry about change, because God's presence is always there. He says, he says, and the spirit of adoption as sons, which means that you have been adopted by. Do you know what adopted means? It means I wasn't his initially, but I'm his now. Huh. What do you mean adopted? You know, when we when we sinned, we broke that fellowship with God. But when you got saved, he adopted you. And ain't nothing like God saying legally, spiritually, emotionally, and every way possible, you belong to me. That's good news for somebody. Because when you know whose you are, you don't have to worry about who they are. And so now go back to Genesis 8 and 15. I'm going to show you. This last thing about accepting what's changed. Genesis 8 and 15. See, changes will make you change. Changes will make you change. Yes, they will. If enough things change in your life, it'll make you change. Enough people die, you'll change. You lose enough money, it'll make you change the way you live. <laughs> yeah, it will. I'm talking, oh, look, come on, come on, be honest with you, boy. Yeah, it will. When you had good money, you would live this way. But when that money ain't as good, you learn how to make it on sandwiches and chips. Uh-huh. You know, see, I, see I, 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 one of the things I've been fortunate about, I, I can say right now, is that I've been, I've been up and down. I know what it's like to have money in the bank. Brenda, I know what it's like to go eat at nice restaurants with cloth napkins and, and steak dinners and great atmospheres. But I also know what it's like to have to go take a pack of Raymond noodles, put them in the microwave, cut up some hot dogs, put it in there, season it with a little salt, a little pepper, and sit down like it's a gourmet meal. I know what it's like to have to be able to drive whatever you want to drive. But I also know what it's like to have to catch a ride and ride the bus. But I thank God that every step of the way, he's always been there. Donna, I can tell you I've been young and now I'm old, but I ain't never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Through it all. I said through it all. <laughs> through it all. He's been there. When I was up, he was there. When I was down, he was there. Paul said, that's why Paul said, uh, that's why Paul said, whatever state I'm in, I'm content. If I'm broke, I'm content. Because either way, he got me. <laughs> Either way, he's been good. And if I don't never get nothing else, Brandon, he's been good to me. At least if he don't never give me another dime, he's been good to me. If he don't never make another way, he's been good to me. But see, some of us, that's the reason we can't change. Because we're too blessed. But when you've been broke, <laughs> when, when you, I said when you've been broke, when you've been broken, when you've been sick, when you've been hurting, that'll bring about a change. Yeah, it will. Yes, it will. It will bring about a change. It'll bring about the type of change that will humble you. <laughs> Ooh, God, yes, it will. I said, it'll bring about the type of change that will humble you. It will remind you that it ain't never been your credit, <laughs> your bank account, <laughs> your career or your job. It'll humble you. He, he, he says, see, and my question is, what dies if you don't change? 
What, what, what do you gain with change? Because if, if, remember, accept what's changed. Look at Genesis 8 and 15. I, I, God, I got to go. I got to go. Look at Genesis 8 and 15. He says, then God said to Noah, go out from the ark. You and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. That's in verse 20. Now I'm going to verse 20. Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird, offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now watch this. Noah has been on the ark for nearly six months. Remember God flooded the earth? And, and he, put, he put them out, got the animals two by two, told Noah and his family, get on the ark. I'm about to flood the world. He put the whole earth through a washing machine, flooded it. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. And then they still stayed on the boat a couple months because they had to wait for the waters to subside. Moses, I mean, uh, Noah sends a dove out to see if he can find land. The bird does not find any dry land. The bird comes back, and then when the bird finally finds dry land, it still takes some time for the waters to subside. Now the waters have finally subsided, right? The waters have finally subsided. They got the, the ark boats, the, the ark docks on land. Moses gets out of the boat. Noah, Noah gets out of the boat. And God says, get out of the ark. Go out of the ark. Why? Because what once saved you is now going to hinder you. He immediately had to change. This ark has been the only thing he's known. It's the only thing that has saved him through the entire flood. And now he's got to change. Just because it saved you don't mean it is it's supposed to keep you. He, because what once was a saving device is now hindrance. The ark was a good thing in one season. But when things change, now it's a problem. He says, get out of the ark. Lord, I thought you told him to get in the ark. He did when it rained. But it's not raining anymore. Can I ask you something? Why are you still living on the ark and we on land? Why are you still committed to the boat if it's no longer raining? It's time for you to get out and go live. He, he, he had to change. He had, why? Because he had to accept what had changed. When Noah got out of that ark, I need you to understand, everybody he ever knew outside of his family and those animals were no longer there. Every business, it, the entire world. Can you imagine stepping out of your house six months later and nothing you remember is the same? From the neighbors across the street, their house is gone. To the stores, the, everything, the, the earth is wiped completely clean. And it is up to you to start it all over. Noah had to do a change because everything had changed. You can't stay on the ark. Noah stepped off into a whole new world. A whole new world because he had to accept What's changed? We fear the unknown world that changes places us in. Change begins, but if you look at what he did, and I'm done. If you look at what he did, if you look at what he did in verse 20, verse 20 says, when he steps out of the ark, he gets to the altar. He builds an altar. He builds an altar. The moment he steps out of the ark, he does not go find something to eat. He does not go find a job. He does nothing, but he gets to the altar and he builds an altar. Because watch this. Blue, you in the vein, man. That's, right, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking. He, he, he builds an altar. He builds an altar. Why? Because the altar is the place of change. Everything changes at the altar. Everything. Weddings happen at the altar. 
Salvation happens at the altar. Everything changes in your life at the altar. And that's why Noah said, Noah said, before I do anything else, I'm going to make sure that my family has an altar. Well, pastor, what does that mean to us today? Are you telling me that I got to come down to the church every time? No, 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 no. In your house, you need to have an altar. Oh, can I teach real quick here? In your house, you need to have a place that's designated to be the altar. See, this is where a lot of us get in trouble. Because we wait till we get to church to get to the altar. But there's some stuff you're going to go through, you ain't got time to wait till they let you in the church. But some things you'll go through in the midnight hour. You ever been sick in your body and you couldn't wait till Sunday morning. You couldn't reach your pastor and your mama, but you had to crawl out of your bed and say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. Sometimes it's late in the midnight hour. You need an altar. And you better go home today and go clear off a shelf, a corner, a closet, or something and say, Lord, this place is your place. It's where I'm going to meet you. You put you some oil in there? I said, you put you some oil in there. And you plead the blood over that place. And you tell yourself, you remind your children that anytime you go through something, baby, get in here. Because the altar is the place of change. Everything changes at the altar. Everything changes at the altar. I remember when I wasn't fit to live and wasn't fit to die. But God saves me at the altar I remember when I was going through hell and God changed me at the altar see we don't do that no more because we done got so modern but I remember a time they used to call it altar call where you'd come to the altar and in the old church you could leave until something changed therefore change has come over me a wonderful that's what an altar does it changes you see a lot of us we come to the altar <laughs> we come to the altar but we don't leave it at the altar. <laughs> we don't change at the altar. But see, when you really get to the altar, you know what the altar is? It's a place of sacrifice. I'm still in the text. Because the Bible says in verse 20, it says that he grabbed some animals, some clean animals. Why, why they gotta be clean, Pastor? Because God don't accept nothing dirty. Whew. So he grabbed something and sacrificed it on the altar. Can I tell you something? Anytime you come here, you need to bring God something. You need to bring God something in exchange for what you're asking for. Why? Because God deserves our best and he wants to know how bad you really want to change. See, many of us we come to this altar and we leave the same and we never change. Because the reason why is because you came to church, but you never came to the altar. But when you are a believer, you have an alternative lifestyle. What do I mean? You're a native of the altar. You have an altar native lifestyle. You are a native of the altar. That's all I wanted you to understand, y'all. That if change is going to take place, it's going to require you to change, period, at the altar. If you're, fear of, if you're afraid of change, I get it. 
But let me tell you, wherever God changes you, he will still be with you. If you're here today and you don't know God, I want to introduce you to somebody that will change your life for the rest of your life. Maybe, you, maybe, you're, maybe you've been, you're confused because this is who you've been all your life. This is the way you are. And then for some of us, somebody I'm talking to, that ain't the way you are. That's what you turn to. That's what you've turned to. But that ain't the way you really are. And it took a change for you to get in this mess. But watch this. It's going to also take a change for you to get out of this mess. I want to help you change today. Don't worry. If you're afraid of change, I get it. And sometimes you need somebody to walk you through your changes. What do you have to lose? You've been going through changes anyway. I would take my chances on the better change. Get saved. Join church. Get baptized. It's time to change. If you keep doing the same thing and ain't nothing changed, it's probably because you ain't changed. But what I've learned is that if you ain't changed, chances are you ain't been changed. But when you've been changed, you don't do what you used to do. You don't go where you used to go. If that's you today, come on down here. Come here. Come here. Send us a message online. We want to help you change today. It's time to do something different. Just come on. Just come on. If it's you, just come on. Just come on down right now. Just come on right now. Just come on. Don't think about it. You've been thinking about it for years. And that ain't changed nothing. Just come on. Just came. Just come on. 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 Has come over me. Has come over me. God bless you. God keep you as I pray. Give the Lord praise to all over the building. Come on. Come on. It's time. Maybe it's maybe it's not a change you need to make. But maybe somebody else needs to change in your life maybe somebody in your life needs to change and you want to come stand in the gap for them you can come in the name of Jesus Father I pray in the name of Jesus that you would send change from this place to that place I pray that you would send transformation from this place to that place Father, you know all about it. You know where she is. I pray that you would send it. Change your, the type of change you got, God. Don't need a car to drive it. It don't need anything but your presence to just be dispatched. God, you can go into hospitals. You can go into jail cells. You, you can go everywhere, God. And I pray right now that everything that they touch change. Change with your love. Change with your power. Oh God, the way they get blessed, I pray that you would do it. The way they see you, I pray that it would change. In the name of Jesus, send fruit, God, from heaven, not fruit from, oh God, send fruit from heaven. No more will we be accepting fruit from evil. In the name of Jesus, we receive it right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, do it right now, God. Do it right now, God. Send the type of change that only you can. Transform the family like only you can, God. Father, you don't have to do it one at a time. You can do it collectively. You changed Israel in one prayer. You changed the disciples in one experience. Oh, God, do it right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God, there's no power in my hands. But all power is in yours. In the name of Jesus. Do it right now, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
Standing in the gap, standing in the gap. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Father, I pray right now. Oh God, we slang all everywhere, God. We pray that you do it right now. Her children, God, I pray that you would send it right now. Send it right now, God. It ain't never too late for you to fix it. It ain't never too late for you to change it. In the name of Jesus. Oh God, do it again. What you did before, do it again, God. Do it again, God. Send it right now to our children, to our grandchildren, to our aunts and cousins and uncles. Oh God, let her household be a place that when people come, they feel a change. In Jesus' name. Do it right now, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Come on, come on, come on. Who else? I don't want to miss anybody. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on. A one. My home, my family, That's everything right. that I love. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We receive it right now. Father, send your spirit. Send the type of joy that's unspeakable. Send the type of joy that can change atmospheres in her home. Send the type of joy. Oh God, the sickness is not comfortable. Send the type of joy that can change her children in the name of Jesus. Oh God, I pray that every broken heart in our home, you heal it. Oh God, I pray that every place where there's an argument, I pray that you would settle it. Oh God, I pray for peace in this house in the name of Jesus. Father, bless her family, God. Unite them like only you can. Oh, cover that house, God. Oh, do construction in that house. In the name of Jesus. And let it begin right here in this vessel. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. That's it. All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, I need some members of the church. Just any members of the church, come here, come here. She asked me to pray for God's will to be done for her relocation. And I want y'all to come and pray. Just come lay hands on her. Just somebody. Come here, Miss Pee Wee. Come on, y'all come on, come on. Come on, just lay hands. Just lay hands right now. Just lay hands. Anybody that can get a prayer through, just lay hands right now. In the name of Jesus. Father, you didn't send her here to leave her there. You didn't bring her out this far to only come this far. And it's her church family that's standing in the gap, God. We're a praying church. <laughs> we thank you, God, for the legacy and the life that you've already put in her. Oh, God, I pray that because we're the praying type of church, Lord, you hear our prayers. You honor our prayers. Oh, God, we've prayed and you've healed folks. We've prayed and you have delivered folks. And I know this ain't nothing for you, God. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God, I pray that every devil in hell be reminded that her family, her church family is praying beside her. And to get to her and her family, he got to come through all of us. And in the name of Jesus, I pray that everything line up according to your will and according to your way. In Jesus' name, that this time next week, we looking for answers. This time next week, we declare answers, God. In Jesus' name. It's done, it's done, it's done. In Jesus' name. We believe that. Oh, we receive that. Y'all hug on her. I know we're not supposed to, but I, I, I we're going to believe God. Come on, she just needs to feel that love. Come on, come on. Come on. Let me get my first. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Okay. Okay. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we've come too far to be dealing with this. We've prayed too much to be dealing with this. And I pray right now, God, for her children. Lord, I lift up to you her son right now. In the name of Jesus. God, you know all about it. I pray right now that you would sabotage his will and replace it with your own. I pray right now, God, that you would order his steps and his stops. Oh God, I pray that you would uproot every demonic seed that has been planted by the enemy. I pray 
that you would snatch away every every evil temptation every devil that's came for him that looks like a friend I pray that you would change it right now God change right now God whatever it is God you know all about it heal the heart heal his mind in the name of Jesus let him submit to your will God and your power Father, I pray that you would honor this mother who's praying on their behalf. Oh, God, she's been good to you. And I pray that you would reward her faith with your healing. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. How can I help you? Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. In the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for those family members of hers that need a provision, that need shelter. I pray right now that you would send it like only you can, God. Father, you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can think or ask. You're the type of God that owns the cattle of a thousand hills. You go away to prepare places for us. And I know that what you've done in heaven, you can also do on earth. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you would change lives right now in California for on her behalf. In the name of Jesus. Oh God, I pray that you would even work it out right now. That even on tonight, God, even on tonight, God, that it be worked out by tonight, God. Oh, that by in the morning, they'll come calling her, saying, I don't know what God you know, but I know he did it. Hey, in the name of Jesus. We thank you. We thank you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Father, do it right now. She's serving you, God, but she wants her family to do it too. <laughs> it's been so good to her, Lord. She wants everybody to do it. And I've seen you do it even in my own family. I've seen you change lives and deliver folk in my own house, God, in my own family. So I pray that as we lay hands on her hands, that we lay hands on her heart and on her mind, I pray in the name of Jesus that the type of faith you've given her be contagious to her family. In the name of Jesus, send change and transformation like only you can. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. God bless you. All right. Oh. Bread House, uh, thank you so much for tearing with us at the altar. I was praying for this, that, that the word would flood our altar with people that wanted changes. So God bless you. God keep you as our prayer. Uh, I, I try to get us out by 12, but, but the Holy Ghost did what he does, and I don't apologize for it at all. Amen. So God bless you. Uh, God keep you. Listen, make sure you give on your way out. Sow into our church. Give on your way out. If this church has been good to you, sow into this house. We got a lot of work we're trying to do, y'all. Sow into this house. We, we, we Listen, be a tither. If you're not a tither, be a tither. If it's not at this church, it ought to be somewhere. You need to be tithing. You need to be a tither. Uh, give into this house. Give into this house or some house. Make sure you are a blessing to the kingdom. Also, uh, when you give on your way out, just give on your way out. When you uh, exit the building this side, I want you to exit through the center aisle, give on your way out and exit, and then go all the way outside. And for those of you who are on this side, to exit the wall and exit the door and go all the way outside. We do not want you to fellowship in the four years just too small. We want to keep our doors open, and so we want to make sure that you can socially distance outside, all right? So put your jackets on, your coat on, all that good stuff, and go on. Well, you ain't got to go home, but we do, we do need you to get out of here. <laughs> Amen. Or just don't fellowship in the, in the, in the uh, fellowship hall. Let me give you the benediction. God bless you. God keep you. May the grace of God, the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us both now and forevermore until we all meet again. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. You're dismissed. God bless you.